a very warm, it's really warm in Bombay for those of you who are joining us from northern and colder climes. Uh, we're in, well into our 30s now, a big switch since February. And um, Robert, if I may address you by your first name, thank you so much on behalf of the chairman of the CSMBS, the trustees, the director general, Mr. Sabia Sachi Mukherjee, the staff of the museum, and on behalf of my executive committee at the Museum Society of Bombay, the members of the Museum Society, the friends of the Museum Society, and all our guests who have uh, joined us here today. It's really very, very kind of you to extend yourselves and uh, give us this lecture. I first read about Robert and I kept on calling him Geddes, Geddes. He said, no, no, I've done my research on him. My name is Stevens. And Dusra ek ankin loshti ahe ke amcha Robert ay na te lai sangla marathi madhi goshti karte. And also in Hindi, he speaks very well. So Robert, I'm going to be greedy. Your next lang uh, lecture, you pick the language of your choice and we'll have the audience ready for you. So I hope you accede to our request and I hope I'm not overstepped my friendship by making that little announcement about you. But to be a little more formal, after completing his Bachelor of Architecture degree from Virginia Tech in 2007, Robert Stevens left his childhood home of Somerville in South Carolina and moved to Mumbai, India. He joined RMA, Rahul Merutra Associate Architects, as an apprentice at the age of 22 and is now a principal at the same firm. Robert is part of the core team at RMA responsible for recent additions to Mumbai's built environment, including the CSMVS Visitor Center, where we generally have all our talks and we are like, wanting to get back to our home as soon as we're allowed. He's also done the Children's Museum in 2019 at Kalaghora, and under construction, the Mata Ramabai Ambedkar Crematorium at Worli. It's quite an iconic piece of architecture. I saw it uh, on display and a video on it at the recently concluded architecture exhibition at the Max Miller Bhavan uh, around the practice of Rahul Merotra. In 2016, he founded Herbs Indus, a studio that narrates lesser known civic histories through the juxtaposition of archival material with contemporary aerial photographs of urban India. His work has been exhibited in Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Hyderabad, Chennai, and Edinburgh, and has appeared in publications such as The Guardian, Domus India, and Scroll.in. He currently lives in Mumbai with his wife and his son. Bombay Imagined was Robert's first book and was conceived in the meditative depths of the Mumbai local train in 2013. I like that tongue-in-cheek comment that he has made, but we can get lost in a crowded place within our own mind and mental spheres. And matured through various lockdowns during the global coronavirus pandemic, which I hope has concluded. We're really looking forward to your talk and a few words about what we're about to hear, just a little teaser. He he'll be talking about beginning in 1690, Bombay imagined an illustrated history of the unbuilt city, tells the story of 200 unrealized urban visions, aspirations of an evolved metropolis, boasting everything from humane housing which we are aware of in those days, expanded parks, little heard of today, to sanitation systems, which have practically burst at the seams and more. Ideas that never saw the light of the day are richly illustrated with archival drawings, contemporary speculations and artistic overlays, illuminating long lost futures from the city's never, in, never before seen past. I do not wish to stand between the speaker and the audience, but I can assure you that Bombay Imagined is a testimony 
to the audacious dreams of city lovers, a chronicle of untold narratives across centuries, and an insight into the tides that have shaped present day Mumbai. Thank you so much, Robert, for agreeing to give this talk. And before I hand you over to our technical team, I would like to thank our technical team, ably led by Professor Dr. Jason Johns, Yashraj, Aishwarya, and Renalini. Thank you, tech team. Thank you for all the work that you do with such patience. And may I add, ladies and gentlemen, it's voluntary. So thank you so much. And I hand Robert over to the audience. Thank you so much. Enjoy the talk. <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Godrej, uh, Jason, and, and the team, of course, the Museum Society of Mumbai and the CSMBS. Um, it's a, a great, great honor. Uh, I'll begin with kind of two disclaimers uh, for this evening, because I, I recognize some, um, uh, some, some friends who attended a previous talk. Uh, if you see the beginning of this talk and you think it's the same thing, it's going to be very boring and just leave, don't. I promise it'll be a little bit different uh, as we go along, so, so bear with me. Um, the second thing is, if you feel at any point in the talk that you want to laugh, please do. Um, it's, uh, there's meant to be a, a reasonable dose of humor throughout this evening. Um, and, you know, speaking on Zoom is very difficult because the audience, it's like a, a black hole, it's just silence. So I almost have this idea that if you feel like you want to laugh, and then if you do laugh, maybe put it in the chat. You can just put a ha ha. Um, and then for those who do that, there'll be a special gift uh, from me at some point. What it is, I don't know. Um, but it will be special that I can promise. So let us begin. Uh, Bombay imagined an illustrated history of the unbuilt city. Uh, you know, like many of us, I enjoy reading books about the drainage of Bombay from the mid 19th century. Um, and this is one of them, Professional Papers on Indian Engineering, 1869. Uh, it's a really fabulous publication, a uh, lot of history. A lot of beautiful drawings, including this one. Uh, this was the first drawing I saw of Bombay that that kind of created this spark, this idea of, of what is now Bombay Imagine. And this was a plan by Hector Tulik, uh, prepared in the early 1800s. And you know, I noticed this big green blob in the middle of the drawing, and uh, it struck me because color in the 19th century uh, in printing is precious. So it was something clearly very valuable. And I zoomed in on this blob and realized it was a huge 400 acre proposed park, um, roughly what is now the Mahalakshmi race course. And, you know, I just started researching this and turned out it was the idea, kind of the, the creation of Arthur Crawford. And he described it as a people's park such as London does not possess. That was Arthur Crawford's vision for that 400 acre park. And I love that because, you know, we, we remember Crawford now for the market, right? And then, you know, those of us who really kind of dive into history then for corruption. But uh, Crawford had these other layers to his life and his time in the city uh, that are really rich and quite, uh, quite creative. Uh, this is Crawford again in the late 18, um, 1880s. And this is a book that Crawford published that I came across at the Asiatic Society Library. Uh, and it's, it's a really intriguing title. It's called The Development of New Bombay. And I love that because, you know, typically we think of New Bombay as beginning in the 1960s, right? Uh, when, uh, when Mr. Korea, Mr. Patel and Pravina Mehta start talking about New Bombay, but as early as the, the late 1800s, this publication itself in 1908, Arthur Crawford is thinking about a new Bombay. And one of the projects in his new Bombay is at the Mumbai Devi Temple Tank. Now this was, this idea was, was birthed in 1870. And he described this as a place more beautiful and picturesque than the Place Vendôme in Paris. He imagined godlike steps in black and white marble, which were to lead down to the water's edge, while gardens with seats were to bifurcate the descent. And you know, from this, this description and this image, you can see that Arthur Crawford, he really understood how people in the city related to water, how they related to tanks, that 
there was, yes, a practical value to having tanks in the city, but there was also this cultural, this social value, um, which was equally important. And he meant to make that a beautiful, even more beautiful um, uh, experience. Unfortunately, there was an opium bazaar uh, that surrounded the tank and he wanted to demolish that. It never happened. And this idea uh, fell by the wayside. So, you know, Arthur Crawford really was the source uh, of, of this whole exploration over the last seven years to, to, to search and discover and think about all the ideas for the city that were never realized, right? Um, a wide range of projects. And, you know, I did a lot of research, um, uh, you know, all around the world, some, in, some uh, searches in person, in, in libraries in London, in the US, many digitally, virtually. Um, and I compiled this, this kind of black folder, which I call the manuscript. Um, it was a really exciting, this was between 2013 and 2016. It was a really exciting time because I was just in the middle of all this research. It was the, the first time in my life I kind of embarked on something like this. And this, this manuscript was created. Um, it sat in my wardrobe. Uh, for those three years, and you know, I was ready to go. I thought we're going to write this book, and then by 2017, 18, it'll be out. And then this happened. Um, my wife and I, we uh, were expecting our first child, Tina Nandi. Um, she's she's also been instrumental in realizing the creation of this book, uh, both the publication as well as all the communication after the book has come out. But in 2016. Uh, we kind of, our life turned upside down because, uh, you know, our son was coming into the world. And we decided early on two things. We said, we were in Bombay, in Bandra, where we still are. And we said, you know, we want to have one, a home birth under the supervision and guidance of a midwife and a doula. You know, we had a backup doctor at a hospital as well, but we were very clear we wanted a home birth. And two, we wanted a water birth. Uh, which is what it sounds like. It's a birth in water. So on May 18th, Tina goes into labor. It was early morning, probably around eight or 9 a.m. Um, very slow contractions. And, you know, we thought cello around the maybe three or four, we'll start filling up uh, the pool, the kiddie pool for the birth. Um, uh, our midwife was guiding us. And then I believe it was around noon that the doorbell rang. And I was like, you know, come on, who's, who's bothering us? The Tina's in labor. I opened the door. It's our security guard. And I said, he said, water cut hai. Oof. I absolutely <laughs> panicked. Um, you know, we were having an unexpected water cut. And that very evening, we had planned a water birth. Uh, so fortunately, we had that two hour notice. Um, I kind of got into gear and became a water manager. Uh, we were able to fill our pool in addition to drinking water for the night. And then uh, just before midnight, our son Kaido was born. Um, he's six now. And, you know, this experience, it, it really made, it kind of brought to the forefront the importance of water. You know, we often take it for granted, but water is obviously an essential part of the city um, to life. And, you know, this was 2016. In 1845, this is what LCC Rivet had to say about water. Amongst the first requisites of a large and growing city is a plentiful supply of fresh and wholesome water. Uh, and he was based in Bombay at the time you know, he wrote this. The very first proposal uh, to improve and increase the water supply of the city is 1852. Uh, this plan was developed by Henry Conybeare. And what he said was, he said, in each of the tanks, the hundreds of tanks throughout the island city, we should have filtering wells, wells that literally filter, naturally filter uh, the, the polluted tank water and then make it potable uh, for all of the city's residents. And it's a really, really beautiful drawing um, he, he created multiple plans for multiple tanks. This is one of them. Um, and of course, this didn't happen because water is not just a physical uh, element that people need to consume. It also had cultural and social values, as Arthur Crawford highlighted. This, these wells would have deprived people of contact with well water directly. They would have had to draw water through 
um, through a bucket. And of course that you know did not work. So this idea was unrealized. And Henry Conybeare was a very interesting man. He, he was one of these kind of polymaths. Uh, he was a hyd hydrolysis. Um, he also you know, prepared drawings for St. John's Church at Colaba. Um, he had his hand in a little bit of everything. And one of his other ideas, uh, which is detailed in Bombay Imagined, is this. He wanted to eliminate all burials and cremations on the sands of Back Bay and relocate burial grounds to the eastern slope of Malabar Hill. Um, he said, you know, his argument was Malabar Hill is useless for construction. Uh, and those are his exact words. And he said, we might as well use it to enter the deceased. And then really brilliant idea, an exciting idea. He said this gentle sweep of sand and water along Back Bay, let's develop this into what he called a marine parade. Uh, basically the first idea for Marine Drive, and this was also in 1852. That was Henry Conybear. Speaking of burial grounds, 1935, uh, this was a proposal by the Bombay Kennel Club to create a half acre pet cemetery at Sudi. Um, uh, also, this did not happen, of course. Um, uh, the, the price of the land was out of reach uh, for this small community. Uh, this image is a visualization, a speculation. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Uh, but here lies Snap, East and West, you were best. Now, all of the projects uh, in the book kind of fall under these different categories, which are basically different functions. Um, the projects we just saw regarding the cemetery, water supply come under sanitation. Uh, and then there's, total, there's a total of 16 different functions. And next we'll look at, uh, we're just gonna transition into a dock project. Uh, this is the Kolaba Channel Docks, 1855. Uh, this is a really beautiful drawing from the British Library. And we're gonna zoom in to this region just south of Fort. And to help kind of create some context for this image, you see Kolaba Causeway, right? That's pretty clear. Apollo Bunder, which would go on to become the gateway of India, of course. And this was the proposed location for import and export docks, uh, exactly between Kulaba Causeway and Apollo Bunder. Um, of course, had this happened, uh, the Taj Hotel would never have come into existence, uh, but this was the proposed site uh, that was eventually struck down, but this was the proposed site by the committee. And just whenever you see these orange circles, kind of zoom in on them, that's going to be the crescent site. Uh, we're gonna track the crescent uh, from this time period, 1855, as you see, the fort walls are still standing. Um, so they're occupying, say, maybe 25% of the crescent. Um, we're going to track, track the crescent site evolution. Now, why did this not happen, um, this idea? The kind of greatest challenge was connectivity, railway. Uh, there was a proposed railway line that you see in dotted. Uh, which was to go from the dock to the proposed cargo terminus, railway terminus, now VT station, CST. Um, and as you see, this dotted line was kind of tracking through the middle of port. And Governor Elphinstone at the time said, I cannot express too strongly the objections which I entertain to an unfenced railway crossing the principal thoroughfares of the island. That was his argument. This is what led to that location for the docks falling. Next, we're going to look at another transportation project. Now, this was the BB and CI and GIP Railway Link, 1867 by Francis Matthew. I'm curious if this Matthew is the same as Matthew's Road. I'm not sure if anyone knows. I'd love to hear ideas on that. Um, and again, this is 1867. So the fort walls have fallen. And, um, you know, literally, the proposal was to link now, what is you know, now the uh, Western line with the Central line to create a continuous railway system without these two dead ends. A radical idea that could turn the Central and Western lines into a single massive network. And I love this quote because it's from 2016 by Kamal Mishra. And this was uh, an idea that was actually mooted by Mamta Banerjee when she was the railway minister. Uh, she was pushing for this, but there were a couple of problems, which we'll see why it didn't happen. 
but they're basically they were repeating this idea which was first you know thought about in 1867. We'll zoom in on the site again you see Kolaba Causeway uh, that is the central railway line which was to kind of snake around and then go through port um, there were two lines actually proposed. One was a locomotive steam railway and the other was a horse-drawn railway. The red is the horse-drawn and that was to go straight through uh, port. And then of course the crescent site. So now you see this really beautiful clean crescent. Um, this is again 1867 devoid of the fort, fort wall kind of graphic interruptions. And this is kind of I think the primary reason why this idea uh, never evolved further. Uh, the locomotive line would have cut straight through Bombay Castle and the horse-drawn railway was to go straight through then an existing large tank in front of the men. And it's really, you know, fascinating to me the, uh, the argument why Mamta Banerjee's scheme was not realized was many engineers said the utilities, the existing underground utilities in Bombay are too complicated to attempt this connection. So it's the same reason, it's kind of this extent infrastructure that foiled both of these proposals. Now, you know, some projects follow these very hybrid ideas, um, you know, hybrid aspirations, and this is one of them, Hector Tulek's Underground Railway from 1869. This was the map he proposed. You may recognize the green blob in the middle. That was Arthur Crawford's Park. Um, Hector Tulek and Arthur Crawford were kind of buddies and they supported each other's ideas. Um, so you, you see this park for, you know, about five years in multiple drawings. Um, you know, they really, really pushed it. But we'll focus on, uh, again, we'll go back to Fort and look at Tulek's railway. So this is it. And, you know, many, yeah, I've seen many plans in, in the last seven years. The only reference to the Underground Railway is this little word tunnel. You see that circled here, and this is a huge map. Um, so it's kind of interesting, I think, how one really has to search hard sometimes. It's literally a needle in a haystack on this drawing. Uh, but this was this was the giveaway for Hector Tulek's tunnel. Um, you see the uh, the empty crescent still, just south of Fort. And this is a description of Tulek's proposal. During the day, passengers were to be ferried southwards into the city center, while at night, northbound carriages filled with the day's business, fecal matter, were to traverse the same tracks. Um, and that's kind of crazy, right? Like he literally, Hector Tulek imagined people would board the train, say around Jacob Circle, now Satrasta, travel to Fort, work, do their business, go to the bathroom, you know, throughout the day, then go back home. And at night, literally the same railway tracks underground was to be filled with these big trains of poop. Um, and you know, that's, I, I just, that's totally crazy. Uh, it's no wonder the, the underground railway didn't happen uh, at that time, um, but it's interesting. And, you know, I love, I love this idea because Hector Tulik was just, he was thinking out of the box, right? Uh, he was thinking radically and if anyone laughed when you read the line filled with today's, today's business, um, you know, that was a success. So thank you. Now, kind of the literature of Bombay Imagined, um, totally inspired by Amitava Kumar. Uh, he's a professor in the US, English, English language professor in writing, creative writing. Um, and early in the, he's originally from Patna, early in the pandemic, I discovered this book he had written, uh, Writing Badly is Easy. And I absolutely loved it. It kind of transformed how I think about writing, how I approach writing. Um, and one of his, I would like to say one of his basic premise is that writing should be fun um, and it should be accessible to a wide, wide range of readers. So uh, he's inspired much of the, the writing in the book. And when I downloaded this image from his website, this was the file name, jargonslayer2.jpg. And I love that because Amitabha Kumar is a jargon slayer. Uh, there will be no jargon. Everything he does has this element of surprise and he encourages you know, young writers uh, like myself to, to work with the element of surprise and humor. Um, and I think jargon slayer does that with the file name. So 
through that book, uh, Amitava introduced me to Anton Chekhov. He was a playwright and short story writer. Uh, he was basically my mentor in the writing of the book. And Chekhov had six principles that make for a good story. The first was the absence of lengthy verbiage of a political, social, economic nature. Now, for me, that was easy because in college, I more or less skipped all classes apart from uh, architecture studio, good or bad, it is what it is. Um, so that was easy. Total objectivity. Um, I've striven to, to kind of be very objective in the book. I, I don't share my personal views on different projects. I leave that to the reader. Truthful descriptions of per persons and objects. Uh, it's because of this kind of pursuit of truth, there are, I think, between 600 and 700 footnotes uh, in Bombay Imagine, which take readers back to the original source material. Extreme brevity. Uh, this was quite easy, actually, because I wrote every chapter in the book between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. I just had no choice um, because the day's work had to be done during daylight hours. Um, and the, the brief I gave myself was, objectively, let's try and limit every project to 200 words. But I think more importantly, only use words that are necessary. Uh, so if, as I was writing, if anything felt like it was not necessary, one just kicked it out uh, and it was gone. Audacity and originality. Um, I've attempted, I, I leave it to, to the readers to decide if that's a success and then compassion. This for me is the most challenging um, component of a good story and I, I'm still learning what this means in writing. Um, any tips? inputs would be helpful maybe after the discussion. And then I wrote for 200 days straight. So before the birth of our son, kind of did all this research, the son was born, life went crazy for a couple of years, uh, and then the pandemic hit and I was really able to kind of settle uh, and write for 200 days straight. Um, it was one of the most fun things I've done in my life. Uh, I look forward to this two hour time slot every morning and I guarded it uh, very carefully. <clears throat> every every word, about 62,000 words, was first handwritten. Um, and as you see, there are a lot of mistakes, uh, a lot of you know, things removed. Uh, and Bonnie Stevens, our cat, would often interrupt for some reason. She had the whole house, uh, one BHK, 450 square feet, but she still wanted to sit on, on the drafts. So I would often, uh, I would have to guard my time from her, actually. She was the biggest challenge in the book, but we love her. Um, so now let's dive into the crescent. Um, you know, like, like the writing of the book, where you saw many things scratched out, many false starts, the crescent site, Bombay's crescent site, also has many false starts. Um, and, and we're going to dive into some of those now. Uh, this is the crescent site in sometime between 1880 and 1900. This is a really beautiful photograph held at the Sarmaya Arts Foundation here in Bombay. And you see, of course, the empty site. And it was around this time that Jamshedji Tata had this idea. Tata imagined that the day was near when men could remain at their usual stations and work in a temperature regulated by artificial means. He had this really crazy idea that we're going to make this circular building on the crescent. There will be offices, there will be concert halls, there will be cultural facilities. But in the very center of the building will be an ice creating factory. And that's going to cool all of the spaces and make it comfortable without fans. <clears throat> and, you know, it was really, really quite radical to think people don't have to, you know, leave their office at any season of the year. Um, why it didn't happen, I'm not sure. Francis Harris, who, who has written about this in his biography of Jamshedji Tata, doesn't elaborate. But obviously, this did not happen. The next idea for the Crescent, this is 1903, is for a grand Bombay cathedral. Um, this is Lord Bishop, 1903. To build a fine cathedral on the Crescent would be, from the aesthetic point of view, one of the best purposes in the interest of the city to which the site could be devoted. Um, for many years, this, this idea of the cathedral was mooted, talked about. The basic plan, in a nutshell, was Let's sell St. Thomas Cathedral, uh, the building and the property, use that money to then construct something grander uh, that's you know, on this fine site. 
uh, you know, one one critic at the time described St. Thomas Cathedral as stuck in a, a back lane of the city, a kind of a small, sad site. Um, so there were these grand, grand visions. Ultimately, uh, the basic outcome was Bombay's Christian community is too poor to do something so expensive. Uh, and this also did not happen. Now, Herbert Phipson, uh, this is Herbert Phipson. He was a wine merchant. Uh, that's how he made his money, but he was very passionate about the natural history world um, and the cultural atmosphere of Bombay uh, from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. And it was actually Phipson, at least in his obituary, he's credited with saying the Crescent site should be a museum. Um, it should be a museum. And, uh, and he, you know, he was successful in, in kind of establishing that land use uh, one of Phipson's other ideas for Bombay was a zoo uh, on Chaupati Cliff, the same place that, um, if you remember, Connie Bear imagined a burial ground. This was Phipson's idea. We would suggest as an admirable site for the proposed zoological gardens, the Chaupati Cliff with all the broken grounds and swampy land, land at the bottom. And, you know, one of the things like this project and many others, they had they were really really rich ideas uh, they would have transformed you know parts of the city um, but there were no drawings okay and and for me that was a little bit upsetting because i'm a very visual person i love archives i love visual material and i was kind of stuck in this this rut because there were these great ideas that i could see but we had no visuals so then fawaz and i fawaz was the the project manager for bombay imagine we were just brainstorming one day we said, what if we create images um, that are all based on historical facts, based on geography, based on the form of the city at any given point in time? What if we create these new images to, for the first time, give life to these ideas? Um, and it stuck, and it was really exciting. This was the first sketch for uh, the zoo, Phipson's proposed zoo, on the eastern slope of Malabar Hill, what he called Chaupati Cliff. Uh, and it was to be an animal kingdom, as you see my, my sketch here. I gave this sketch to uh, a visualizing artist, Aniket Umaria, and he developed the model. He kept working at it. And then he created this really beautiful piece of art. Um, and uh, I just, I love them. There are 30, 30 pieces in the book like this, all of course different. And uh, I just, I feel very close to each one because more than a month was spent evolving and developing each piece in the background um, is of course Tardeo and Mumbai Central. You see the mills with their black smoke. This would have been Bombay, uh, the Bombay Chaupati Cliff Zoo in 1888. This is Aniket. He was one of the artists behind uh, many, he did about 20 speculations uh, and there were, there were four other artists that worked uh, separately, but with him. This is Deshna Mehta and Carol Nair. They did the book design um, uh, the graphic design and the book layout. Carol's favorite project was actually the pet cemetery. So that image you remember earlier, that was also a speculation created by visualizers in Europe, actually in Berlin and Athens. And then that's Fawaz. Uh, we would not have Bombay imagined without Fawaz. He did like just, he, he managed the book um, and, and really brought it together in many ways. So thanks Fawaz. Now let's zoom in to the museum on the Crescent, right? We've seen the failed uh, ideas for the Crescent. Herbert Phipson comes into the picture. Now let's see how the museum evolves. Um, there was this idea, let's open it up to a design competition. 16 architects entered. And this was part of the initial brief. In a great and busy hive of industry such as Bombay has become, it would be particularly refreshing to have one group of buildings which will not only provide quiet and restfulness within, but will even suggest it from without. So that was the initial brief, part of the initial brief from a special committee, 1907. One of the entrants was James Gibson. He was a, an architect based in Glasgow, a Scottish architect. And this was his entry. Uh, and and he, he kind of talks about it as responding to the crescent. You see these, these very large kind of voluptu voluptuous curves uh, of the proposal. And I just love the font uh, that he's, he's used. 
it's interesting. You can see, you know, art and archaeology, sculpture courts, but also future extension plans um, in the top and uh, top left and top right. Uh, it's an interesting idea, just seeing the museum continue to evolve. This was one uh, praise uh, that was given to his work. His grasp of mass, line, form, and color is unsurpassed by any other competitor. This was the Building News, London-based periodical in 1908. But then this was a critique. Mr. Gibson is considered by the assessor, who is John Begg, to have shown himself perhaps the most able and artistic designer, though his scheme remains among the least acceptable for the purpose. So the basic critique was, yes, these forms are beautiful, but we can't have curved walls for art for a gallery. So, um, you know, he was, of course, a runner up. The next architect we'll zoom into, again, a Glasgow-based Scottish architect, James Miller. And James Miller is a really fascinating guy. Uh, this was his, his proposal. It was a very classical uh, kind of edifice layout, very formal, symmetrical. And this is 1908. Mr. James Miller, Glasgow, has been appointed architect of the Prince of Wales Museum, Bombay. Um, he was actually appointed. Uh, uh, the, the, the special committee said, we love this plan. Uh, it matches our aspirations. It meets our program. Um, they had actually, as part of the brief, also said we want the building to look like an Italian Renaissance building. And they felt his layout did that. Uh, so he was appointed. And then something happened, and that was overturned. Um, and uh, what I've read is that they said it was too expensive the design. And so in his steed, another Scottish architect was awarded the project, George Widget. This was George Widget's first competition entry. Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a, an interesting plan because what you see on the screen was created by Fawaz Khan. Uh, he's not only project manager, but a very artistic uh, person and creative. Uh, but this plan is fully derived from a sketch held at Reba. Um, the, the sketch of the original layout is in Reba, and we just reproduced it with, with precision here. Uh, it's just a fascinating, you see this, the central building and then these two, again, very voluptuous curvilinear wings that respond quite brilliantly to the crescent and its unique form. But this was the critique of this first proposal. Its appearance is somewhat against it. It does not look like a museum. The treatment adopted suggests something between a college and a monastery. Uh, and these words were from John Bake, uh, 1908. And John Bake was, uh, you know, he was, he was kind of like a mentor from what I understand to George Widget. They worked very closely together, um, but obviously he did not think highly of this first proposal. So in this bizarre twist where James Miller is overturned, George Widget becomes the architect appointee but then he's told to redesign his building. Um, and this is what the redesign looked like. Uh, it comprised a central building, which was built, which we now know today as the kind of the core heritage building of the museum. Uh, he imagined an industries building on the, the left here, and then a natural history museum on the right. And it was actually planned to be phased. Uh, there was, this idea was from the beginning that the central building will happen first and industries then natural history. Natural history was imagined by the special committee as having the least practical utility. Uh, it's a very interesting analysis, um, if not <clears throat> a bit insulting to, to many, perhaps. Um, so this was with its revised scheme. And one commentator in, in 1908 said, this is dangerous because when you phase things in Bombay, they never get done. And that commentator was exactly right. 1924, this is George Whitted. As the building now stands, it is a torso and can never be satisfactory until its two wings are built and the group completed. Five years later, and I think two or three years after Whitted passed away, the original comp competition design was greatly preferred. It was more original, more Whitted, pure Whitted. And I love this because this is John Begg speaking uh, in London at what is basically, he's basically eulogizing uh, after the passing of George Whitted. And he's come to this realization that 
I was wrong. Um, I was wrong in my critique of his first design um, and asking him to, you know, change the, the style. Um, and it's really interesting. I, I like to think it's, it's almost like this architectural confession, you know, um, and I, I wonder, I wonder for any of us if we'll have these kind of regrets, uh, you know, after the architects we know pass. Uh, who have had great ideas. I wonder how many of us will have these kind of regrets that we didn't take advantage of the talent, of the resources with us now. It's an interesting, interesting question. John Begg obviously struggled with it. Now, George Whitted also had other plans in the city that remain grossly incomplete, the Gateway of India Avenue. Um, he designed, of course, the Gateway, but he also imagined this grand processional avenue that led up to essentially the junction in front of the Crescent site. Um, the gateway was built, World War I kind of uh, exploded and the, the yacht club was not demolished as he had planned because of financial constraints. And then in the I think, early 1930s, Regal Theater was built and then all hope of this processional avenue uh, was squashed. And this again, John Begg, with its work was always big, broad, and masculine, never a touch of the niggling. Um, this was again part of that eulogy where John Begg was reminiscing, reflecting on with its work. And I love this word niggling because I'd never heard it before. This is, this is one of the, the joys and, and kind of discoveries of reading old books is you kind of get these glimpses of words that are English, uh, but have just fallen out of use. And I think niggling is one of them. At least it's not a word I use regularly, regularly although I, I want to start now, reintroduce it. And niggling means inconsequential, right? So George Whitted's work was never inconsequential. And as thinking about, you know, again, consequentiality, Charles Correa was consequential. And he also had ideas, imaginations for the Crescent site. Uh, a Museum of Modern Art in 1981. This was uh, part of a model that his office had prepared, uh, again, for, for this Museum of Modern Art. You can see the heritage building with the dome in the background, and then this very sculptural, very kind of uh, monolithic entrance gate on the footpath in front of the museum. And this is how the one of the earliest analysis or kind of uh, comments on the proposal in 1983, a commercial plaza, which would mean sacrificing greenery and involve the felling of trees. Now this is April 15th. Okay, so just keep, just kind of note that date. April 21st, six days later, inquiries showed that the facts contained in our story entitled commercial eyes on museum garden are not correct. The error is regretted. So Charles Correo was a victim of fake news, basically. Um, uh, his idea for the museum was essentially sabotaged. And this was a correction published even later. What Mr. Correa had actually suggested is an art gallery with a souvenir shop and a bookshop, which would not mar the existing beauty of the Prince of Wales Museum, but would fit into the ambience of the area. And I just, I love that because it's a really elegant correction but unfortunately, the, the fact is, and, and we see this even more so now, once fake news kind of starts circulating, it's hard to counterbalance. Um, and, uh, and I don't know for sure, but I would presume Mr. Correa struggled to correct that, um, that fake news, which he then had to struggle with. And as we wrap up, um, I'm gonna stop on my favorite unbuilt project for Bombay. Uh, there was actually never a drawing for it, uh, ever. Uh, it was purely an idea from the 1950s. And it was here at Merriman Point, uh, the Air India building. Um, and, and the story is that Le Corbusier, the Swiss, Swiss French architect Le Corbusier wanted to design this building. Um, and, you know, I've, I've seen a few of his buildings, uh, the mill owners building in Ahmedabad, uh, a couple of buildings in France. And it's just, it's magical what he does with space and light and, and material, uh, but mostly space and light, it is just magical. So 
yeah, uh, by far my favorite project and I have no idea what it even would have looked like. And this is what Charles Correa said about this in 1986. Can you imagine what would have happened if Corbusier had built that building, this building at the end of Marine Drive? It would have been an architectural gesture that would have changed our lives. 10 or 20 other people driving down Marine Drive would have been inspired to create a building like that. It would have changed our city. And that's, a, that's just a very powerful statement. Uh, it would have changed our city. So this was 18 projects. Uh, Bombay Imagined is 200 unrealized visions for the city. Um, these are some spreads. This is New Bombay, uh, also a really, really beautiful idea. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for listening and would love to discuss any questions and I desperately hope there's some laughter in the comment section. Thank you very much.